my PhD project is quite possibly the strangest discipline crossover that you are ever going to encounter. And I think the, the most concise way that I can explain that is to tell you who my supervisors are. I have got two incredible people in my corner. One of them you likely to, you may well know, uh, the, Dr. Lorraine Darcy is herself an engineer and uh, she is also a sustainability action research and innovation lead in TU Dublin. My other supervisor is Dr. Caroline O'Sullivan. She is the head of the School of Media in TU Dublin. This project is in like spatial design and engineering, media, social psychology, sociology that all came together. And in my opinion, it resulted in something really, really interesting. Now, because I am from a creative media background, chances are the presentation you're about to see might not be what you're used to, but I invite you to come with me on this journey um, and I will explain to you what I did, how I did it, and especially how is all of this relevant to you in your everyday work. So staying completely on topic, let's talk about rip currents. Uh, or riptides, as they're often more uh, well known. The first inkling you usually have that you've been caught in a rip current is just the shore is an awful lot further away from me than it's supposed to be. Um, and the second thing is about rip currents, so they're very subtle. You know, it's not like a river and flood that you know, ah, it's dragging me along. Very quiet and subtle. The next thing you know, you're far away. The second thing is they're very, very powerful. There is no human being that can swim against a rip current, not even Michael Phelps. Social forces are very similar to that. They are very powerful. You cannot be human and not to be moved by them. And they are very subtle. You are very unlikely to know and be aware. Oh, I'm being influenced by this stuff. Now, before I go on, I want to address uh, a bit of an elephant in the room. I am sure that you have uh, figured out I am not from around here. I have, in fact, come to you here tonight in Dublin, all the way from there, North Cavern. That is where I'm from. But yes, okay, the accent. Before I lived in North Cavern, <laughs> I came to Ireland from South Africa. Now, I haven't been back for 18 years now, but a lot of the ideas that brought me to where I am now started with my experiences there. South Africa is many things. It is a very beautiful country. Its people are amazing. They are so resilient and incredibly um, innovative. Um, it is also one of the most stratified societies in the world. Um, we always think first of race, but the thing that is less well known about South Africa is that people are very class conscious. Um, so it's a very class conscious society. The other thing that is almost a little weird about them is that there is a very strong tendency to afford social status based on age alone. Now, that is not my mom. That is a random picture that I uh, found to demonstrate age. <laughs> But I want to tell you a fun fact about my mom. She was, born, uh, she was born at the tail end of the Second World War, and she was what is known as a lot lamiki, a late lamb. Her parents were already in their 40s when she was born. Now, that means there was a very big age gap between her and her brother, and she was not allowed to call him by his first name. She, she had to call him Buti. In Afrikaner culture, you do not call adults by their first name. If you're a child, you call them um or tani. And while it technically means uncle or aunt, um, it's, it's used as a title like Mr. or Mrs. So I came from a life where I observed a lot of that social stratification and social status based on group membership. 
But my research was not about the South African culture. It was about bicycles. The first question that really piqued my interest and led me to eventually uh, start conducting research was, what is up with the way that people talk about cyclists, the way people communicate about cyclists? What is up with this terrible, like, aggression and virulence and anger that comes up about what is, when all is said and done, a form of transport? What is up with that? It intrigued me. I wanted to find out. The second thing um, was more an experience than a question. So the context was this. I was in my undergrad studies, and no, that wasn't in my 20s. That was just a couple of years ago. And I was riding my bicycle. Now, I was in a cycle lane. It wasn't quite as bad as this one, but it was also a painted cycle lane. Now, I was sitting in classes learning about discourse. In a nutshell, super simplified. There are people who've made careers out of explaining discourse. Super simplified. It's this massive conversation that all of us have with everything around us all the time. And I'm learning about this and how everything speaks. There's a message in everything. And I'm getting along on this cycle lane. It's a painted lane. It was wider than that one. The surface was pretty poor. There were drains every now and then. There was so much debris on that cycle lane. It stands out in my mind because there was a place where you couldn't see the cycle lane. And suddenly, I just saw the wider picture. And right beside me was this beautiful, perfect, well-maintained, spacious surface provided for my fellow road users who chose a different form of transport. And it was quite an uncomfortable observation because it reminded me of a photo I had once seen, which I think it was taken in South America, of this luxury uh, tower block of flats, really beautiful, and a wall, and then slums. And it was uncomfortable because how dare I compare this experience of cycling here to something as massive as that. And yet, the, the, the kind of social forces behind the big stuff can often be scaled down and found in much smaller things. I am well aware that engineering is not necessarily known for being associated with qualitative research, but we cannot get away from the fact that what you see there, um, spatial design like that, uh, well, all spatial design is an act of communication. If you are involved in bringing any kind of infrastructure into um, fruition, into being, you are a communicator over and above whatever else you are. And I know, I know very well that especially the audience that I'm speaking to tonight will be able to look at that and say, oh, I know, I know what happened there. I'm not an engineer, so I'm going to take wild guesses. You may say, oh, yeah, funding ran out there. Or you'd say, yeah, that is what happens when you follow the rule book beyond where it makes sense. The problem is that people who come into the space don't have that background knowledge. And the, the, I know, I know there are so often really practical, logical reasons for decisions in infrastructure design. Those reasons do not change the message embedded in that. I mean, when somebody arrives there, that space says something to drivers. It says, welcome. It says something to cyclists. It says, it, it says something that I'm not going to uh, say aloud here. It even says something to pedestrians. If you look closely there, that footpath is really uneven and patchy. So we cannot get away from the fact that whatever else you are, if you are involved in road building, in spatial planning and, and the building of it, you are a communicator as well. So I put together a, hypothes a hypothesis that the roads network should be understood as a social system. Road users are social groups and it's a stratified hierarchical order of social groups. Um, drivers are a do the dominant group and 
I was specifically interested in cyclists. Cyclists are a subordinate deviant minority art group. I want to be clear, the word deviant is not an insult in this context. It is actually terminology from sociology. Um, it means something that is different from the norm. Uh, so that was my hypothesis and I applied social dominance theory it was my lens that I examined things through. Uh, social dominance theory was published by then Dr. Uh, Jim Sedanius and Dr. Felicia Prato. They both later became professors and um, Sedanius passed away in 2021. But it is that theory of basically whenever a, a society gets an economic surplus, you then find the stratification starting to happen with social groups. So that's the lens I applied. And I'm going to kind of start at the at the end with what I found. Um, <clears throat> drivers are constructed in the media as a social elite group, an elite social group. You have negative discourse on cyclists in controlled media. And when I say controlled media, it's media where there's some answerability. So in my case, I examined radio. I looked at television, radio, and then social media as the un uncontrolled uh, media where there's no, you're not answering to anyone. You don't have a boss. You don't have advertisers. You don't have a regulator. And there's very negative discourse there as well. So starting at the end, and I'm going to walk you through how I got there and, and why and what it means for you. So let's first look at drivers being constructed as, as an elite. I examined television advertisements. And the reason I examined television advertisements is because it's the most universal depiction of road use in audiovisual media. Um, it is a little bit problematic because an advertisement is, of course, going to construct things in a certain way that benefit them. That, again, doesn't take away from the fact that that is the majority representation of road use that we all see. Um, so I have a couple of clips here where I went to uh, very much hope it's, it's very short and compressed, but I very much hope that I'll be able to show you how this works. Um, drivers are constructed as a, an economic elite. In other words, driving equals rich person. So see here how subtle there's a swimming pool. That's definitely not a, a cheap house. Um, the sports that she is implied to be doing are not ones that you would uh, normally access. This dude is traveling around at least Europe, if not the world. He's clearly been at it a while and you need money to be able to just go off and travel the world. This one I slowed down as much as I could. Look at the office. It's a spacious private office and watch carefully because I unfortunately could only get a flash of this one, the balcony that he then walks out on. That's not, that's not a poor person. Look at all these trendy, amazing people being jealous of you in your car, looking up to you um, with your wonderful suit and your very attractive girlfriend. And who is this guy? There's the car that they're advertising. He is the boss. Sorry, that was also a very quick flash. So in media, it can be very subtle. It can be very quick. And of course, you don't have, this was a super, super quick clip. It, I obviously sat with 90 advertisements and like analyzed them second by second. Um, very much found construction of drivers as an economic elite. Next is, uh, um, cultural, uh, where am I, an intellectual elite, intellectual elite, that is people who are at the cutting edge of their field. Um, I am completely obtuse, I do not know if that is a famous chef, I assume so, but I do know that Jürgen Klopp, who uh, appears in this ad, yeah, I mean, everybody knows who he is, look at this person being depicted as this fantastic computer hacker on the news, this guy, Superman, super abilities. Um, that is the, the scientist girl, you know, amazing. Who is her boss? Well, her boss is the driver. And she shares the, the news with him of, of the discovery that she made. So that is how drivers are. It's a very quick snapshot again. 
that that is the way the drivers are depicted as this um, intellectual elite. I'm hoping I don't get my terminology mixed up because I haven't got it written down. It was like, I know this stuff so well, I'll, I'll remember. <laughs> Uh, right, and then you have um, cultural elite, basically trendsetters. Uh, so people who, who, the it people, like the Kardashians and so on. So let's have a look here. Very trendy, very modern, very artsy as well. Um, this was interesting. Colorful socks or shoes were a sign of creativity. Look at us with our humble houseboat. Look at these shoes, sign of, even though I'm all gray and everything underneath, I'm really creative. So that's, uh, that's, that's the other way that they're constructed as that uh, cultural elite. Access to elite sports, loads of that shown. I do not know a single person who's ever gone like boarding down a volcano or has gone, uh, so I don't know uh, if you do, Interesting, look at his clothes compared to hers. He's blue and white and she's gray. Now, if you watch the ad, she has this, it's this sort of like, oh, I had tea for the weekend. And he is like, um, what did I do for the weekend? And it's this adventure and going on the snow with all these mites and all that. So that's that subtle sign that this guy is this colorful life. Um, loads of elite sports access. Um, the road, oh, the road is depicted, it's constructed as the exclusive and rightful territory of drivers. It's usually shown as a space that is free from obstructions, free from other road users, except distant and far away. They usually don't bother you unless they bother you so that they can showcase how good your car is and getting out of it. Roads are constructed as a racetrack where drivers can do whatever they like. 103 miles per hour. There is not a country, not even Germany, I think. Maybe on, on certain special roads in Germany where 103 miles per hour is a legal speed. And yet that's what, what's shown. This car is doing that. And the road that it was shown on did not look like a racetrack. It looked like an ordinary road. However, they put flags on there as if it's a racetrack. So that's the message that we're given as drivers. You know, is this is what the road is, it's yours. There's a lot more. Uh, for instance, driving makes you the perfect parent. But the important thing uh, that I want to convey here is this thing of a social elite. And the car is super very much constructed as the key. You buy this car, that's your key to membership of this elite. And if you've got this car, the road is yours. It belongs to you, it's your property. Right, so negative discourse on cyclists, which is control. I have a wee video that I am going to play that I put together to summarize what I saw on radio. And I hope that um, everything works with it. Let's see. It starts very soft. So just wait for it at around the 10 second mark. You should start hearing the uh, sound. This next story may well depend on whether you're thinking about it from the cyclist or the driver's perspective. Okay, so the reason I've got this article in is to just demonstrate the mindset of the person that was interviewed. This article he wrote was in twenty. Michael Sheridan, is it simply that we have a city that isn't actually adequately designed for safe cycling? Absolutely, Matt. I mean, D Dublin itself, the heart of Dublin is a medieval city where the widest thing the roads are built for was a horse and cart. So we've a very limited amount, amount of space. And unless we go up and over or find uh, wasteland or find some way of compulsory acquiring, acquiring um, enough road space that we can um, have cyclists separated clearly from cars, the problem is going to continue. And about 10 metre wide roads where I actually have to walk on the wrong side of the road around that bend so that an oncoming car could see me, where it's a blind spot. In other words, I have to be alert 
to the actual safety issues. I have no divine right to protect myself, a car legally coming at me at 50 kilometres per hour. Is there not a kind of moral hazard issue for cyclists that actually it's a dangerous thing to do and that no amount of laws can overcome that? And the reality is that the vehicle cannot see a cyclist and won't feel a cyclist. One thing is lights, the other thing is high vis, and you don't know how invisible you are. Do you think high vis should be a, a rule for all cyclists? Of course, yeah. And for example, uh, Dublin bikes, they're not providing a cyclist with any no helmets or, or, or high vis jackets. And a lot of people are talking to me about uh, some cyclists, uh, you know, go, getting out at night time with uh, no, not even a light, let alone a high vis. You hear um, a lot of bad press for cyclists, but it's not fair. The, near, the majority of the cyclists are easy to be seen, cycling safely. What do you think of the 1.5 to stay alive? Uh, is it possible? I was driving around here Dublin last night and most of the cyclists I see didn't have any lights. And let it be said that you're visible from many kilometres because you've got high vis, you've got a luminous pink, you've got a rucksack with a luminous cover on it. You're not one of these people who oh is no. invisible. You know, I was in France cycling in Germany and the amount of respect they give you when they're passing, you know, and it's only, it's only a matter of seconds. That's all that people are saving, you know. There are a lot of people that don't cycle safely. I was in the cycle lane, the defined cycle lane, and a bus passed very close to me, almost touching my elbow. Um, I'm an experienced cyclist. I was able to cope with that, but it's, it's a very, very frightening experience for the vast majority of cyclists. The cyclist is on his little bike, weighs about 10 kilos, doing maybe 20 kilometers an hour. In that battle, Sean, there's only going to be one loser. And what we're trying to do... Yeah, is, and maybe is, the basic uh, w wisdom should be you don't argue with a bus if you're correct. on a bike. I was in the cycle lane, the defined cycle lane. You know, this Dan in Port Leash um, says, I hate cyclists. I drove in Dublin City last week. A cyclist got angry at me for not giving him enough space, so he purposely hit my car mirror and tried to sh show his disgust, even though he wasn't in a cycle lane. Well, did you show him enough space? I mean, the fact he's not in a cycle lane doesn't mean you don't yeah, show him space. There's a lot of that happening. A lot of them getting yeah, very you know what? and I'm smacking sorry. cars. You know, you know, last week, oh, no, sorry, just listen, just listen to the story. Hello. So cyclist cyclist started to my in. mirror on my car, then me and the cyclist going to have a serious crash, and he won't have to be worrying about banging into my car a second time. Let me tell you. Right, so that I'm not sure. You I'm have not been sure warned. That's... So, especially with that last conversation, it's the topic is how do we keep cyclists safe, and that's basically a death threat. If you have difficulty really sort of feeling that this is not okay. Uh, try to think of someone you love and some quality that they have. My youngest son is left-handed. And I try and think of people saying the things they say about cyclists, about all left-handed people. It kind of brings home to you that this type of speech is not okay. And when we talk like that and talk like that, we push people's minds in the direction of violence. So that's, that's what we found on radio. Now, social media. I analyzed more than 1,500 social media comments. And let me just tell you at the end of it, you're like, ah, ah. so I'm not going to go into specific comments. I'll show you the, the <laughs> I'll show you the summary. The um, pie bits uh, in blue are basically anti-cyclist sentiments and in green is pro-cyclist sentiments. The gray was un unrelated, it, wasn't, it was sort of about, but it wasn't either, either way. Um, I'll highlight just two comments. Both of these comments were on the same thread of a Facebook post, the same thread. One calling for cyclists to be banned from rural roads. The other one, calling for cyclists to be banned from everything but rural roads. So I, I'm, I'm showing you these to show you there's no logic here. There's no winning this debate, this argument. Um, and it's, it's, uh, 
it can be very depressing if you start looking into the sentiments that are washed around here. Now, um, sorry, I need to, oh, oh, this is gonna be interesting. Sorry, I couldn't understand why is nothing coming up there. Um, so I didn't just go on my conclusions from the media discourse analysis. I did a follow-up study. I conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with 16 respondents. Now that's not a lot, but each interview was quite intense. Uh, it, it was almost an hour. And the one part of it, I did a lot of word association and stuff that was super interesting for people like me who are really into media and that sort of stuff. But I think what you will find very interesting is where I showed people video clips of ordinary everyday traffic situations that in some way involved cyclists. And I asked them a set of questions. The first two questions were, is the situ uh, situation that you just saw okay? Do you think that was fine? Because I said to them, there will be clips where there's, there's just nothing wrong. And there were. Um, but if you, if you say, no, it's not okay, then talk to me about why uh, you think it was not okay, but who do you, do you blame the most? Pick one road user that you blame the most, because I was testing for the assignation of blame. There are certain patterns in how we assign blame if a social dominance dynamic is indeed an operation. So I was, I was checking to see, is that what happened? This is the first clip that I show people. So have a wee look, and you think for yourself, how would you answer is this okay? And if it's not okay, who do you think is to blame? So I'll play it again. So just, just by yourself, to yourself, do you think that what you just saw there was okay? And if not, who, who would you blame most for feeling ooh, that that wasn't right? If you think the situation was not okay, uh, you agree with 14 of my 16 respondents. Um, and all of them blamed the cyclist. All of them said, no, the cyclist broke a red light. But this, here's the thing. If you have a traffic light control junction, it is, it is the, the, the usual rule is that is you turning right you yield to oncoming traffic. It's not that oncoming traffic must yield to you unless there is an arrow. And in that video, you cannot see if there is an arrow. So people defaulted to um, assuming that the, the cyclist must have broken a red light, but both road users in that situation actually acted completely 100% appropriately. The car was waiting to turn right and they waited, the, the driver yielded to oncoming traffic and the cyclist cleared the junction as fast as possible. There was nothing wrong with that situation. The people assumed that the cyclist broke a red light. For interest sake, research has found that cyclists are no more likely than any other road users to break the law. They, they are not these reckless lawbreakers that they are uh, painted to be. Let's look at the next one. Oh, sorry, I put it in again to just so you can just look again. Like there's no sign of an arrow, there's no sign of a red. And if you look at the, the longer clip, that situation actually repeats a couple of times where cyclists are actually busy clearing the junction and um, other uh, vehicles yield for them. So clearly there is no arrow. Next one, look carefully. And let's play it again. It's pretty short. Right, so what do you what do you think? Um, again, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot and say, answer the question. Think to yourself, was that okay? And if it wasn't okay, who's to blame? Who's at fault? Most of my respondents said that the cyclist was to blame. Um, for one reason or another. Some said that the, a, a driver was uh, to blame. Um, and it was uh, people assumed, uh, at least a couple of people assumed, I forgot to put that in my notes, that uh, this was a one way and that the cyclist was going the wrong way. And very, very few said 
hey, it's illegal to park on footpaths. And if these vehicles were not parked on the footpath, the cyclist wouldn't have had to go out like that into the road in the first place. So that is what happens as well with social dominance. We are blind to the faults and mistakes of the dominant group. I'm gonna try and go a bit faster because we've been half an hour already. Have a look at this one. This is super interesting, super interesting. Okay, so with the benefit of having sat on the video and been able to analyze it basically second by second, um, here is what actually happened. So sit on your answer there of who was it there? What type of road user there was most to blame? What happened was this uh, faster cyclist in the dark clothing wanted to overtake a slower cyclist. Perfectly correct, you indicate. Now remember that the biggest threat to his safety, I think it's him, um, comes from oncoming traffic behind. So he's looking over his shoulder, making eye contact with the driver of the filming vehicle who is holding back so that the cyclist can overtake. So he then finally looks forward. And as he looks forward, he's like almost on top of this other cyclist who has in the meantime, moved out to turn as well. But because this guy was looking behind him, he didn't see that. Now, he could have done one of two things. He chose to swerve around the, the cyclist. Maybe not the best of choices. He couldn't slam on the brakes because his arm was out. And if you're gonna slam on the brakes with one hand on the handlebar, you are putting yourself at risk of a crash. So he swerved around the cyclist because his other option was cut off by the illegally parked driver blocking the cycle lane. We do not see these things. I had respondents sitting there getting me to pause the video and play through it bit by bit to see, does that cyclist with a high vis have rear view mirrors on their bicycle? Because maybe that is what is to blame for this situation developing. And they do not see that massive car parked in the cycle lane that if it wasn't there, that cyclist in the black, the faster cyclist would have had the option to, to just stay in the cycle lane. But that wasn't there. Every one of us basically swims in the sea that is the culture and societal thinking around us. You can resist being influenced by this culture as much as that surfer can resist moving with the movement of the water. To be human is to be affected by the society we live in. You cannot avoid it. And the way the sea of our culture moves is to push everyone towards the subconscious thinking that drivers are the top dogs and all other road users are lower on the hierarchy. Remember my, my the research was particularly interested in cyclists because they're like a lightning rod for all of this negative communication. But in the course of my research, I was like, hang on, everybody, everybody that's not driving actually is lower down, even people using public transport. Let me not get into that because then we'll still be here for breakfast. Now, what does all of this mean? It means that we will have a tendency, we will be pushed in our thinking to giving a greater share of good things to drivers. And the good things that all of us want when we are on the roads, whatever way we use it as space and priority. We will have a tendency to overlook bad behavior if the person was driving and place blame elsewhere or simply not see the wrongdoing. We will give a greater share of bad things to cyclists, also others, but it's complicated. We will also be quicker to blame the individual rather than the environment when the person was cycling or walking or whatever. And I'll show you quickly uh, one more video to demonstrate that. So watch the pedestrian. It's an adult with two kids. The driver of the filming vehicle actually stops to let them pass. He checks for oncoming traffic, thanks the driver. They cross pretty safely. So many of my respondents were very critical of this pedestrian because 
how can he be so irresponsible, especially with kids, to be crossing a road when there's not a pedestrian crossing? What pedestrian crossing? There isn't a pedestrian crossing. So we look at this sort of social dynamic gets us to look at the individual. What did the individual do wrong? Instead of taking a step back and say, could it be the infrastructure? Could we improve the infrastructure such that this behavior doesn't happen anymore? Is everything really, is it really the individual's fault? But we push towards thinking that it is. Here's another thing, and this is my final slide. Um, with this depiction of the road being the absolute natural and rightful property of drivers, I know that we look at that and we say, but there is space for cyclists. There is provision for cyclists. They use the same lane as drivers. Picture this. You're standing in a room and there's a man with a gun. It's loaded and the safety is off. You know that man, other people like him, have shot people like you before with their gun. You know that if he were to shoot you, there's not going to be any particularly life-changing consequences for him. He doesn't need to use that gun to make you feel nervous. He doesn't even need to be a, a person. He might be a really responsible gun owner and he'd never think of shooting you. It's not going to make you less nervous to be in a room with this person with all this potential to harm you. And he doesn't need to hit you with a bullet to really rattle you. And that is what cyclists feel like sharing the road, sharing the road with drivers. There's this mindset that it's not their property, that they're intruders. How dare they? That's so strongly reflected in social media and, and the radio um, commentary as well. So please bear that in mind. All of this is important in um, what you guys do. Sorry, I promised that was my final slide and I was mistaken. We're, our minds are weighted in favor of drivers and everybody else is less important. So what to do? Be aware in your daily work that you have this force pushing you in a direction. Be aware in the creation of policies and guidelines because that's a place where we can really think about these things. Take another perspective. Get on a bicycle. Go and cycle that road to see what it feels like. And be aware and take measures against bias when we examine the causes of collisions and of um, fatalities especially. That's my final slide. Thanks very, very much, everybody.